Welcome to week one, um, week uh, exam one review. Exam one covers a lot of chapters and you're going to be like, hmm, what do I study? Well, as I said, you know, just earlier to you, make sure you go over this uh, um, review. Um, you've got a lot of information in this PowerPoint. There's what, 80 some odd slides? Yes, it's a lot, but there's a lot of duplicates and blank slides in there. So it's not as crazy as you think about it. Look at it, think of it, and try to remember it in a manner that you do, and then go over the cahoots. The cahoots are going to test you on the knowledge you just learned. And the cahoots are there to give you the concept. It could be turned around either way. So if you know that, let's say you're talking about a child who's 10 months old and you want to know where their development is, you know, I could ask you, uh, should how old should a kid be to sit up unsupported? And it's eight months. But if I said 10 months, what can they do? Then you would say, well, they can crawl around things. They can stand up by themselves. These are things that you could switch these questions around. So just remember that as we go along, okay? So let's go ahead and let's start with this exam one. I made it orange because it is Halloween month, right? And I've always been uh, near and dear to me, Halloween. My grandson is going to be Iron Man. So, and I'm teaching. So I don't get to play, but uh, I'm that uh, parent who has really good candies for the kids because I appreciated it when I was a kid. So exam one, a lot of things in this exam are gonna be referred, uh, four or five questions are on theorists. We know Erickson is going to be there. You know, Erickson, we have these five different things. Let me try to explain it in a manner that you understand it more, okay? So this is somebody who says, Sir Erickson, that as an infant up to 18 months old, you are only about trust and mistrust because you really don't do things by yourself yet. But if you cry, mommy comes because I'm hungry, wet, need a burp, just want you. Somebody comes get you, you have trust. There are situations and abuse type situations, they're not there, so that's mistrust. Now, the toddler group. Think about toddlers. Me, 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 mine, mine, mine. They're all about egocentric. Me, their ego is them. Nothing else matters. So autonomy. I want to do it by myself. The shame and doubt is when the parents say, hey, don't do that. Be careful. You're going to fall. Here, let me grab you or let me do it for you. Toddlers want to do it themselves. That's the shame and doubt. Initiative and guilt is now these children are starting to be able to do things for themselves. Um, but again, they're not doing them all right. So that leads to the guilt. Now, the other area highly, highly uh, tested on is industry versus inferiority. And I don't know how to describe this to give you some jingle lingle, something to remember it by, because that's how I remember things. Industry, what is an industry? Well, it's a business, it's a big building. It's what I can do, my task I can do well. This is the way I build my life around. I am a great cook. I am great at math. I'm great at sports. I'm great at something, that's my industry. And that gives them that sense of accomplishment and they feel good because people praise them. Now you can't be good at everything, can you? That's your inferiority. OK, because you can't be good at sports and school and everything. There's something you're not good at. OK, inferiority. And then remember your adolescence all about. Remember, they're going from children to adulthood. So their identity is, well, who am I going to be? Who am I? What group do I fit in? Do I like girls? Do I like boys? Um also, my appearance, do I like short hair, long hair, am I too fat, too skinny, too many pimples, identity, identity, identity. And remember that identity leads to a lot of problems with their body image and poor body image can lead to depression and depression can lead to suicide. Very real in the adolescent world. And that's all that confusion. So I think I've described this in a manner. If I asked you a question, you could understand more. Now, Freud. Freud is everything something sexual, right? 
we're talking oral, anal, phallic, latency, genital. It's all sexual, right? Oral is all about exploring the world in their mouth. That is your infants. That's your young kids. Well, then you get up to two, three, they're potty training, right? So remember, bowels come before the urine. So you they can control their stools better. So that's anal. And then it goes into the phallic stage. Boys like their moms and moms like their girls. And again, um, it goes on to say about same-sex peers as we get up to the latency. And then, of course, we know adolescents are all about that sexual exploration. And that is, again, the genital stage. Kohlberg. Kohlberg is all about knowing right, knowing wrong, and knowing that there's a consequence for each, whether good or bad. You do something right, you're going to be praised. That's your reward, right? And then if you do something bad, it's going to be punished in some manner. Something's going to be taken away, or you go to your room, or you're going to be yelled at. You're not going to feel good. As the kids get older in the school age, they want to please. They want to have that pleasing sort of things, right? And then it's teaching them how to be a part of society as they get older. And that the adolescents, remember the end of adolescence, they move out of the house, they go to college, they get their own places, right? Their own jobs. And they start to conform to what society says they should in order to be able to be accepted. Colbert, right and wrong, punishment and reward. Now, Piaget, Piaget is all about thinking, taking something that you figured out and then building upon it. Example, those primary circular, tertiary circular reactions. This is all about getting a rattle. You grabbed it. It was, you know, now a voluntary palmer grasp. And all of a sudden you moved your hand and it shaked. Ooh, you like that, right? but then you put it in your mouth and, oh, you like that too. It's like finding your finger, your thumb, stick it in your mouth. It's like, mm, I'm self-soothing and I like that. And it gets older where if I throw my sippy cup on the floor in my high chair, you know somebody's going to come pick it up for you, right? Now, concrete operational. It, this is your school age. There's a lot of confusion between concrete and formal operational. When you're formal, it means you can figure anything out. F, formal, F, figure anything out. Remember being a teenager wanting to get something and mommy told you no, but you made your bed, you made her bed, you took the garbage out, you got an A on your test, you did the dishes, you cooked dinner, you figured out what you had to do to get what you wanted done, right? That's figuring your way out of a paper box. That's formal. Concrete is more like, doing things that you've seen before. Formal, you're figuring them out now. So again, it's more thinking. These are all things that will show you what I've just said. They're there. They're there for you to look at. As I'm saying, there's a lot of slides that will help you look and think, but I think I described them very well, okay? So then take that and look at that and try to figure it yourself. But I think I've given you that good information. Now play. What do we do all the time? I mean, I got a game on my phone that I like to play. It's all about making words. Uh, I sort of say that, oh, it's good for my mental. You know, when you get older, you have to stimulate it. But here, I'm at my age still playing. What do we do from the get-go as a child? You play, you play. So there's names for them. And you need to know what these names mean. Onlooker, you just look. It's somebody look, playing with something. Solitary means me alone, playing. Parallel play is absolutely all toddlers. Remember toddlers, me, 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 mine, mine, mine. They don't like to play with another kid, but they'll play next to each other. That's parallel play. Associative play, two or more kids all playing together. Usually you, these are more your preschoolers because they'll share now. They'll share back and forth. But there's no goal. They're not creating anything. They're not building a tower. They're not building a house. They're not building a sandcastle. They're doing nothing, right? But they're all playing together. Now, cooperative play is still all those kids, but they're doing something. They're building a house. They're playing checkers. Somebody wins. There's an outcome. They're creating something. There's a goal. So it's more organized, okay? 
So cultural differences. I mean, we know that there are so many cultures here, you know, and it took me a long time to understand this. I come from a very narrow minded, small little town in New York, and there wasn't a lot of different cultures. And when I was 23, I moved here from uh, New York into Miami. And now I'm hit with culture, right? I ended up marrying a Cuban, having two beautiful children. I am now married to a Jamaican for the last 20 years and happier than I could be. But you can see I went into the cultures, didn't I? I had to understand what they are. I don't have to accept, but if I'm giving care to a child, I must know what their preferences are. How do we know that? We ask. Don't assume. And I want you to know parents are really happy when you ask. You know, there are some cultures that the girls can't have a male as a nurse. There's cultures that don't eat meats or don't eat pork or don't eat this or don't eat that. So these are things that needs to be asked. Now, if it's an older child, teenager, ask the kid too. He knows what he wants or needs or she does, right? or ask the parents. So again, um, this is important. Now, sometimes spiritually, so there are cultures that do different sort of things, um, believe in different things. Now, I don't have to believe in what you believe in. I just need to know where my spirituality is. And I need to allow you the opportunity, well, is it praying six times a day? Or maybe it's something like Indian, um, you know, Native Indian. They have, you know, their whoever come in and, and do these chants. As long as it doesn't interfere with the medical care, it's okay. You're allowing them to have their own spirituality. Again, just know who you are. Examine your own and let them be wherever they need to be, okay? Now, how to assess a child. Well, kids are not head to toe. You're taught that in adults, right? Health assessment, head to toe. <laughs> Throw that out the window. So number one, whenever you deal with a child, never tower over them. I like to sit below them. Now I'm non-threatening. Number two, I'm going to get their trust by doing something, depending on their developmental age. You know, babies, I might look at them and smile and talk pretty. Maybe toddlers, uh, I'll, you know, say, oh, you've got such cute little eyes or preschooler. Oh, wow. I love your Batman shirt. That's cool. Now they think I'm a cool person and they're not going to be afraid. Then I'm going to let them play with the equipment if they need to. If it's something I'm trying to teach them, I might show them on a teddy bear or a doll. All these things are all okay. Now, one of the hardest children to uh, listen to their breath sounds and their heart sounds is an infant. They're always cooing, they're always moving, and it's hard to hear as it is. And then you get them cooing and crying and moving, you don't get great sounds. If they're asleep, that's the first thing I'm going to do. And if they're up on mommy's shoulder, I'm going to listen to the backside posteriorly first. And then maybe try to slip my stethoscope in underneath. And I'm telling you, you'll get a great breath sounds, great heart sounds, and the kid doesn't even know what you've done. And they're really happy. So sometimes you have to break up assessments. Now, remember when you're reading questions, is it physical or is it, you know, um, history? Okay, remember, physical is things you can touch and see, body systems, vital signs, height, weight. We well, you know every visit in children land, it's a heightened weight. We're monitoring a lot of things to making sure that they grow. Now, growing. Any age child, one of the most important things that we can help is with nutrition, nutrition, nutrition. We know that nutrition feeds the brain. It helps the, the brain grow. It helps the muscles get stronger. Um, what do you see and uh, how do we know that the nutrition is good? Well, that's the height and weight. Think about an infant. They go back to the doctor in two weeks after they're born. We weigh them and we take a length, right? Then they're back at two, four, six months getting their um, immunizations. And we're doing that height and weight. 
And if we don't see their weight doing what they're supposed to and their height not doing what they're supposed to, something's wrong and it's probably nutrition. Infants should double their birth weight at six months. Born at seven pounds, they're 14 pounds at six months, and they should be 21 pounds at one year. Monster, you know, just about there. Don't think that it's exactly there, but close enough, okay? And especially if they're doing all the developmental things you're supposed to buy one year, you know you've done good. One of the things that we can detect what's happening with Infants that are too much or too little, because that happens too much and too little, is have the parents give you a 24-hour diary. Anything with nutrition, always. Any age kid, you're worried about nutrition, always do that diary, that 24-hour diary. Now, body mass index, part of um, when you get to the calculate with confidence thing, it's going to show you how to do it, and you're going to be doing some of them. Um, it's the most accurate uh, looking at um, a child. Um, and it tells you, are they where they should be? Um, just to know that there are some percentages. So if they're in the 85 percentile, which is large, it's high, they're at a risk for overweight. When they get up to that 95 percentile, they are overweight and they actually considered obese. So 85, we're just getting overweight and 95 would be more. So again, find out, get that food diary. Here's an adolescent we're talking about. Infants, any age children, food diary. Now, why do we do developmental assessments? Well, what if they're not lifting their head by six months? They still have, you pick them up by their hands when they're on their back and their head lags back. They can't hold their head up. There's a problem. So what do we do? Early intervention saves a lot of children. Children are the most resilient of all people. When we give them that early intervention, physical, occupational, speech therapy, they catch up so, so quick. Okay. And there are all sorts of programs out there and they're all available. They just need to look them up. Or maybe we as nurses need to help that parent, right? Looking at the abdomen, looking at a kid, first thing we always do is just look. What's the kid look like? Easy laying there, not moving. That kid's sick. The kid's up running around, screaming, yelling, going bonkers. Well, that kid isn't as sick, is he? He looks pretty good. So first look, see what everything looks like. We can see abdominal breathing. We can see retractions, nasal flaring. We can see their legs going because <gasps> their, their tummies hurt. Okay, inspection, just look. Then we need to listen, what's going on? Do all of the quadrants, do percussion in that um, abdomen, and then we'll do palpation. And we could find out, is there something going on in those bellies? Young infants can have GI issues, and we'll get into that when we go to the GI. And it, a lot of it's just by looking at that abdomen and that listening. Now, when you get to capstone, you're gonna be doing an assessment on an adult, right? So, or maybe they'll have a younger kid. You need to know where you need to listen to uh, different valves in the heart. So this is just something you're gonna have to look at. So, and this is describing them exactly where you're gonna hear the aortic valve, pulmonic, mitral, tricuspid. Breath sounds. Well, I'm telling you, pediatrics is a difficult um, thing to listen to because their necks are shorter and the upper respiratory mucus noises are sometimes referred into the lungs. So if we listen to those tracheal breath sounds, like right here, the bronchus, you know, we're hearing a lot of this upper airway mucus and a lot of kids have that. So it's not rails or ronchi, but then when you go down to the lower bases on the lungs, we know those vesicular um, are those real breath sounds. It's not that mucus that's coming up above. You know, I actually teach new nurses. If you listen to their neck, which is right there by the tracheal uh, bronchial breath sounds, we know that that is upper airway. And sometimes we tell them to cough or blow their nose and then it clears up. Car seats. Well, what do we know about car seats? Well, it should be for the younger kids less than two we're facing, they're saying in the middle of the car seat now. 
we've always put it on the right side of the drivers behind the passenger seat, right? So we can see them. They're now recommending in the middle because if they're hit by a car on either side, they're safe. And that's the reason why. Make sure their harness straps are on nice and snugly. And remember at two, you can put them front facing. Now I I've told my class, my little grandson was only 24 pounds at two. He was a peanut, still is a peanut. And we didn't know what to do. So we asked the physician. It's because of the muscles have matured more. They turn them around. It's not necessarily the weight. So he was allowed to go front facing. And that's a little bit more for you. So infant, I told you, you know, knowing what happens in infant. So that head lag should stop um, about three months old. It should be coming up when you pull those arms. Remember, they need to sleep on their back. Um, if they're sleeping on their stomachs, um, this leads to SIDS death. This is the highest incident for that. We know they can roll from their bellies, abdomen to back about five minutes, and then they're back to their belly at six months. So by six months, they can roll over. So now this is a child you need to protect from falling, right? They know that children on their back exploring the world how do they explore it in their mouth their feet goes in their mouth their hands goes in their mouth and anything else they can find goes into their mouth remember their teeth should about six months start and as i said i never saw teeth in my two children or my grandson that was close to me living with me for a while till 15 months and then they got six or eight and again that's normal but they say at six months, you should start seeing them. And usually it's the lower incisor that comes out. They should be able to pull themselves up. And they're on the side of the couch. And now they're moving by nine months and sitting unsupported. There's no cushions around them at eight months. Colic is a curse. All of these poor parents who have colic, they do everything. They usually will outgrow it by three or four months old, but colic is gas and they cry and they cry and they cry. So we can teach them a lot about, you know, burping them well, not overfeeding them, you know, all of these things, using the gas medicine. Many times it doesn't work, but it's eventually with a lot of sleepless nights, um, exhausted parents, it usually starts to go away. And it doesn't matter breast or bottle. It doesn't. Now, one of the things with nurses, we can assume it's colic, right? Don't ever assume if a parent calls you that their infant, let's say the infant three months old is crying and crying and crying more than eight hours a day. Don't assume it's colic because it could be a lot of other stuff. That infant, remember, they're susceptible. They're immunosuppressed. They don't have an immune system really yet. They need to get, come in. They need to go see a physician. So developmental periods. <clears throat> Sequential trend is they lift their head up. Then they turn from belly to back, back to belly, up on their knees. Then they're standing up, creeping, crawling, walking. See, it happens in a sequence, okay? Developmental pace. It's They do... Uh, a skill, and they'll go further. For instance, you talk about a grasp. They start out with reflex, and then it goes to, you know, voluntary. Sometimes they may go ahead. Uh, for instance, they may never walk, but they run, okay? As long as they're going forward in the right directions, there's good. And those sensitive periods are those times where they're not doing a lot of physical changes, but it's all about their learning more and listening more language, et cetera. Posterior, the back of the head, there is a fontanelle. This is uh, six to eight weeks, it closes. Okay, that's fine. Anterior, 12 to 18 months, usually about 15. That's the top of the head. We need to know that because if it closes too early, there's problems. And if it's open too, too longer, there's other problems. So it's something we look at. If it's still wide open, there could be something hydrocephalus, brain tumor. Something's going on in that head, right? Now, I love these pictures of this little child. Think about each eye separate and they don't work together. So you see here, 
you see here, and they don't work together, which means there's no depth perception at all. They can't, they, because they're, you need both eyes to get to that. So they usually about four months old, they're starting to get that depth perception and these children now will grab toys, et cetera, et cetera. And at 12 months, they're about where an adult is. So their vision comes, it has to grow also. Pain. You know, what do you see when you see pain in a child? Well, they're gonna cry. Uh, but remember, crying could be hungry too. So what else would you see? You see that little forehead wrinkled up, okay? That little chin will go, and when those little, little chin goes, it just oh, breaks my heart. Eyes are closed. Sometimes their legs are moving, they're thrashing, or they're just, <gasps> you know, um, it's not a good thing. So what do we do with pain? Remember, it could be positional, could be Tylenol, it could be gas. Um, it's some, one of those things. Sometimes distraction helps them forget about the pain until you can figure out what's going on. And distraction is used a lot here especially with the younger kids. As I said, cis death, this is for those children who fall asleep on their tummies uh, for bedtime or nap time, um, soft, loose bedding. Um, they shouldn't be in the same bed as parents. Smoking is a big thing in the house where a child is. Those children, uh, those parents or adults smoking should be outside. Um, what about just having a cold? I mean, when you have a cold, what happens? Usually it's all nasal mucus, you know, and they don't know how to breathe. They're obligatory nose breathers. So they're sucking and swallowing with their mouth. Their nose is clogged. Now you're going to have problems with nutrition. Nutrition, right? Males are more than females. Low birth weights no prenatal care, and breastfed are less apt to be SIDS deaths than formula. Formulas are more. Reflexes. There's all sorts of reflexes we see. Babinski is any age from newborn to adults. That's the stroking of the foot. Now, what are some of the ones that we know, infants that we need? You know, we sit there and we... Um, take their little chin and, and we uh, stroke it. You know, this is when we're talking about rooting. This is sucking. This means you go like that to get them to go to the breast. This is what we teach breastfed parents. Um, then there's a moro, which is a startle, same thing. And then we've already talked grasp. The, uh, first of all, it's reflex, and then it goes to palmer, goes to pincer, crude, and then fine, etc. Now, Parachute reflex. Ever take an older um, infant, about six to nine months old, you turn them over to put them down in the crib, their hands and their feet come up. It's part of a parachute reflex. It actually sort of prevents them from getting their heads banged because they'll, they'll put their hands out, okay? And it usually starts about six to nine months. Nutrition, first six months, all human milk or four... Uh, iron fortified formula, whichever one is a decision. Of course, we know breastfed is, is the best one, but there are parents who can't do it. And that's okay. As long as they're getting iron fortified formula, they're gaining weight and they're healthy. That's all that really, really matters. We know that milk the first year is only breast milk or iron, fired, fire, iron fortified formula. And at one year, we can change it to regular whole milk. That whole milk, they need that fat in it, okay? We know when a baby is born, um, these children are going to lose a lot of weight and then they gain weight really, really quickly, okay? And the way that, you know, we get a lot of these parents who are in the newborn ICU and we're measuring everything and, you know, all of a sudden they're ready to go home and they're just breastfeeding. They're like, I, I don't know how to do that. I are they getting enough milk from me? Well, as long as they have six to eight wet diapers, we're doing good. Whether they're wet with urine or urine and stool, and it's usually both. Now, the second six months, we start introducing food. We start with rice cereal. So that's the, the, the most allergenic of all foods out there. But we're going to do one at a time, 
wait three to four days in between before adding another. And allergies could be spitting up, abdominal pain, diarrhea, could be a rash, so to look for it. And as I said, weaning from the breast or bottle, it's whole milk at 12 months. Immunizations. Well, at the hospital, they should get their hep B vaccine. Um, if not, uh, not given there for whatever reason, uh, they will get it at the doctor's office at that first two week visit. <clears throat> at two months old, two, four, six months old, they're getting a slew of vaccines. They're getting rotavirus, the, the diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis. It's the homophilus influenza that's given you know, earlier. It's the regular influenza vaccine cannot be given till six months. There is a difference there, okay? And one of the concerns is, oh my gosh, how many needles you're gonna stick into that poor child? Remember, one of the things we try to give these children, even infants, is atraumatic care. We can use a topical anesthetic. Put it on there, it can be numbed up, and then the children's not gonna really feel the pain of the injections. This is the table out of your book, basically, and it shows it. Just know that it's two, four, six months, and then about 12, 15, 18, and then about four, two to four years. It, it's just knowing that there are a sequence of events. And if a kid's sick with fevers, they're not going to be giving them. And the one thing about immunizations, I warn you all, is if you're on steroids, remember, you are immunosuppressed no live vaccines, okay? That's a big deal, whether adult, child, toddlers, my dive bomb kids, right? So again, I've told you how to approach them. Number one, get below them. If they're sitting on a stretcher when I was working in the ER, I would pull up a regular chair and sit down next to them, you know, and just sit there and talk to them, not touch them. And I would get that nice little rapport, developmentally appropriate, and then I'm going to have play. Now, many times, and my PhD dissertation um, led me into some research at my hospital, which proved that children held by a parent during any sort of procedure had less fear and stress and pain than those children that were just you know, held down on a stretcher or a bed. So um, if parent wants to hold the child, the child's comfortable, please do it. You know, in Miami at the big children's hospital here, if you ever, one of you has ever worked there, Huggies is my program. It's H period, U period, G period, et cetera. Help us give great injections efficiently and safely. And it's been used there since uh, about 2010. And it's still part of their program because it's so relevant today. Toddlers in pain. Well, remember toddlers you don't always see them screaming, crying, and quivering, and uh, as you might see with uh, an infant. Usually what you'll see is in children that are in pain or sick, they stop eating and they stop playing and they'll be sitting in the corner. Or you're going to see them crying and they're just inconsolable. So um, that will show you something's happening with pain. Now, Pain scales, important. We have FLAC, and FLAC is ages one up to three. And at three, the faces scale take over. FLAC can be used for nonverbal children also, which means an 18-year-old cerebral palsy who doesn't speak could be a FLAC scale. And there's ways to use that, okay? Now, when we're addressing pain, remember, you know, yes, we do the flax tail, we get our number, we prove the child's in pain by looking at the face, the legs, activity, cry, controllability, all that sort of stuff. Um, but then, you know, remember, just giving medicine is not all of the job. It could be these non-pharmacological strategies. It could be changing position, hot pack, cold pack. Um, it could be uh, let's turn on the TV. Let's put on cartoons. Let's uh, give you stickers, give you something to play with. Music is a great thing for kids. They just love it and they do calm down with it. So it reduces their perception of pain. Why? 
they're not focused on pain now, right? They're focused on, you know, the music or something else. And again, remember when we're giving stuff for pain, it, you know, maybe that medicine is only in IV form. Remember if we can give it IV, not in an injection, or we can give it in a manner that does not cause pain, it will be better. Or if this child is one of those fearful ones to use those numbing uh, creams and lotions to do that, you know, so they don't have the pain. Toddlers don't grow fast. <clears throat> they go, you know, it's only triple, they're quadruple their birth weight at two and a half years. They tripled it at one year, right? Two and a half years old and they're already quadrupled it, but it is very slow now. They have what we call a physiologic anorexia, which means they don't eat much and they will have preferences. And this is absolutely normal, okay? So um, these children don't need as much food as they did as infants and they're gonna be picky. You're going to see their gross and fine motors become more and more developed. You're going to see them be able to throw a ball. You're going to see them um, start to climb up the stairs, um, improve manual dexterity. They're not as clumsy. Their social development, usually by age one, it's mommy, daddy. Well, I was lucky I had a Nana for me too, but usually it's one word sentences. By two, they're talking multi-word sentences. They're telling you what they need or what they want. And now by two, they're feeding themselves. Remember, they might have the spoon upside down, backwards, wrong way, but they are trying to attempt to feed themselves. And that's all part of the learning process. Toilet training. Remember I said, this is the anal part of Freud and it's all about potty training, you know, and they're gonna start having time where they're having periods of dry diaper or sometimes um, when we start this, um, bowel will absolutely be accomplished before bladder control. They can feel it better. They can hold it better. Urine, they can't. They can get it to the bathroom where it needs to go, okay? Injury prevention, terrible twos, right? It's that blender without a lid. I just love that saying because this really describes those toddlers. Ages one to three, intense exploration, temper tantrums, no, no, mine, mine. And how do you work with them? Well, sometimes they're a little bit out of control. So you need to have some sort of discipline. Timeouts are the best form. One minute per year of life. Preschool, ages three to about six. You know, we're still growing slowly, but they're still picky. And they're gonna refuse certain foods and only eat what they like. Absolutely normal. And a lot of times you can't make them what they don't want to eat. Absolutely normal here. Kohlberg. You know, we talk Kohlberg, we know it's morality, it's good and bad. They understand it by punishment and reward. They know if they do something good, they'll be rewarded in some manner, whether it's just verbal praise, for them that's okay. And they know if they do something bad, that they're going to get some sort of punishment for that. Maybe time out, maybe they lose their iPad privilege, whatever it is, they're going to lose something. And also you're going to see these mostly up to like preschoolers, sometimes toddlers, um, they know if they do something bad. They're starting to understand what the bad is because they've probably been punished before. So they know um, what they're doing, most of them. And you think they don't, they do. Also, these children are now seeing, you know, mommy don't feel gear, that good, feel well. She's holding her head. You know, they might come over and they might kiss your head and say, all oh, better, right? And pre <laughs> this preschool age of Band-Aids. I probably have about 300 Band-Aids in my house, all different cartoon characters. Spider-Man is the one and Paw Patrol is the other. And I don't know the rest of them, SpongeBob. But a Band-Aid fixes everything, doesn't it? 
It's they feel this is why the band-aids. They feel that if they're cut and they're bleeding, their their body is going to bleed out and they're going to die. This is their fluctuation on death. Put a band-aid on it, all better. So okay, I have band-aids in the house. Wong Baker, you know, this is your faces scale. Remember, flack is ages one to three. But if you're asked about a three-year-old, we're going to put them right into the faces, okay? And faces, they can look at those pictures and no point to how they feel. The best thing about children, they're honest. They don't overrate themselves, they'll tell you. And they say the numeric starts at the book at age eight. Gross motor skills on a preschooler, you know, you're playing basketball, riding a bike, you know, you're hitting baseballs and you're jumping, right? So ages three, you can walk a line or a low balance beam, you know, a plank of wood on the floor, skip or gallop, walk backwards. They can ride a tricycle, catch a large ball, jump on two feet. Some kids do these earlier, okay? That is absolutely normal. By the time they're ages four to five, they can stand on one foot. You know, before that, they can't, and they fall over. Um, they can stand on their tippy toes, hop on a foot, jump, jump over a step, over a hurdle, and now they can run and turn around as they're, they're uh, running. By age six, remember now we're getting into school age, right? Six to 12, the school age. So activities should be at the level of the child. Don't ever give a kid something that they'll never be able to do. All they're going to be is feeling inferiority, right? Industry versus inferiority. So what can they do? Well, they can ride a bike. They can jump a rope. They can play hopscotch. Don't try to put them in team sports yet. And giving them solitary card games, they're not going to do that. So again, do something that they will achieve. And don't give them anything that will frustrate them because they can't. Fine motor skills on children, excuse me. Fine motor skills, you see it, We're using the fingers, right? F, fine, is fingers. We can color in the lines. We can build things better. We can make little projects. We can button a button. And getting ready for kindergarten. You know, preschool programs are something that the children are put in. They need to be. Why? Well, number one, it promotes all fine and gross motor skills, and it prepares them how to sit and to listen. It increases their attention spans, getting them ready for kindergarten. As they are getting there, as parents, we need to teach them that they need to be uh, telling the kids how great it is to learn and that they're going to be going to school next week or whatever it is. At night, during the day, whatever, read to the children. And, you know, get them into little sort of opportunities that are with children, you know, whether it's going to gymnastics or going to, you know, something age appropriate for them, bouncing on trampolines that, that's organized for that age. Those things help them to understand other children and work together. OK, another thing is don't talk to these children as young babies you need to speak to them you know, in a in language appropriate, developmentally appropriate sentences. These children understand more than you know. Now, common uh, uh, communicable diseases. Now, we do get the varicella vaccine for chickenpox, right? You still can get it. And I've seen it repeatedly. How would you know they had chickenpox? Well, get a child in and the triage note says, Child's been with a fever two days, not eating, um, has a rash. There's little scabs at different levels of healing. Um, and you're like, oh, that rash with different level levels of healing, you know, with the pustules on the end. Number one, this is airborne. Chicken pox is airborne. And whenever in doubt, give yourself protection first. Get that mask on. Get a mask on that child and get them into one of those what we call negative pressure rooms. And what that does, it puts the air out. It doesn't keep it in the, the hospital and spew it back so other kids can get it. 
And here's the other ones. You know, fifth disease is that little smack in the face looking thing. Hand, foot, and mouth looks like herpes on the mouth um, and the hands and the feet. Um, these are all viral diseases that these children get and influenza. Now, types of child maltreatment, neglect. Neglect is they don't have food, shelter, supervision. You know, they're not getting their medical care, educational care, or emotional care. Sexual abuse. Remember, there is children that are abused. Now, one of the things that I want you to remember um, I've seen many cases of abuse, neglect, um, and some of them have hurt me. I still remember them to this day. Remember that the parents, especially if it's sexual abuse on an older child and they didn't know what was going on and they find it out, these parents are upset too, if it's not the parents, right? So make sure that we don't forget that they need a hug also. They're suffering when you're taking care of that child. There's always a patient representative, social worker, somebody there that can help you with that, okay? Because emotionally is a big thing. And remember, we know that physical abuse is when they tell you a story and those injuries don't add up, there's a problem. There's no way they could have gotten that by, you know, falling down and scraping their knee and they ended up with a concussion. I mean, just think about it. Does it match? Nutrition, 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 right? They're not getting what they need, but this is what they should have. You know, 1,200 to 1,400 calories a day, and that's normal. Remember protein, what is it good for? Remember, it's good for good wound healing. So what are preschoolers doing? They're falling down increase accidents with these kids because they're more mobile, they're more active outside, throwing balls around, running. For that wound healing, we need good protein, okay? And calcium. And you need to know the amount of grams of protein and calcium that you need. Now, when you're unsure what a child's eating or the parent's concerned, again, get that 24-hour diary. And another thing we need to teach is about children that we figured out, like, for instance, they have iron deficient anemia. How would you tell them how to help that child have more energy and be less anemic? Well, put some green leafy vegetables in there. They don't like that. Put some eggs in there or put meat in there. And those are things that can help um, give that iron to that child. Now, school age children. Ages six to 12, we know that they grow a lot in that six years, but again, it's slow and it's their step. They gain weight and they get taller. They gain weight, get taller. It's very slow over those six years. But if you look at the whole thing, you know, it looks like a lot. It starts out with their baby teeth. The deciduous teeth comes out about six years old. And it ends at age 12 with puberty, okay? And remember, puberty or that starting of puberty ends up with their menses about two years later. So we'll start seeing those breast buds um, in puberty on girls about age 10. And then we know boys are a little bit slower at age 12. The one of the things they're starting to understand, they're understanding more and more and more about things and the concepts. You know, as a young child, you take a tall glass and fill it with milk. And you've taken a short, fat glass and you put that one in that and you fill them both up and it's the same amount of, let's say, milk in each. The younger kid wants the tall glass, right? They think it's more. Well, the school age child knows that the shorter cup has the same thing in there. Again, this is conservation, knowing that if it's a big ball of clay or smash uh, clay, they know it's still the same amount. Remember, school age love to please others. They like that. They like the re, you know, the uh, praising, for instance, like their industry, what they do well. What they're looking for is that praise. Injury prevention. 
Remember when you talk Hesse's and Clicks, it's always injury, safety, and infection control. Those things are always there. So we know motor vehicles is the big thing. The most common cause of injuries in children is motor vehicle. And by the time they're preschooler, it increases. And the reason is, is they're more mobile. They might be playing in the front yard and their ball goes in the street and they're so mobile, they're out in the street trying to get that ball and guess what? More injuries. And again, it was a motor vehicle. We know that water safety needs to be taught. I mean, uh, I'm very blessed. I've got a pool in the backyard. Christian, I taught him how to swim. And by age two, he was doing front flips in my pool in the backyard. This kid was uh, 30 pounds doing it. And I have videos of it and people are like, I, I don't believe it. But I'll tell you one thing, he will not go in that pool without asking first. He knows better and he knows how to swim. So water safety, especially in South Florida where I live, important. Do you realize your children should be in the back seat till they're 13 years old? It's part of what they feel. Booster seats till eight years old, making sure they use proper equipment, bike helmets, uh, wrist guards, knee pads, whatever it is, making sure that they have proper equipment. And, you know, I live down in Homestead where there's this big open areas that there's all these ATVs and kids love to do and ride on them. It is not recommended for children younger than 16. They can't, what if they get stuck somewhere out in the wild? What would they do? Um, they're not prepared for that yet. So it is recommended not younger than 16. So obesity, big thing today, right? We know that nutrition should be from, you know, pregnancy on. It's, you should, mothers should be eating right. And then of course, infants need to eat proper. And then the children. We know that today when they get to be school age, sometimes they can't get outside because of where they live. Okay. But there are um, children that can go out and they're there watching TV, they're on their video games, their phones, you know, and they're sitting sedentary. So I call it the electronic age, right? They just want to play their games. Well, what happens is they're sitting there snacking. They're not moving and they're gaining weight. With that increased weight, we're going to be seeing them at risk as they get older for diabetes and hypertension and high cholesterol. So we need to educate and school age children are a great age to educate, okay? It, diabetes has nothing to do with race, culture, nothing. It has to do with that sedentary lifestyle. So we can help um, by getting them up, getting them out, getting them involved in something. So what does Erickson say? Same sex peers, right? They're boys with boys and girls with girls, and they're their best friends, breaking away from mom and other people now. Remember when you're talking to kids, school-age children, remember, 6 to 12. That six-year-old, don't tell them you're taking an x-ray. All they're seeing is these, these little beams coming out of this whatever's eyes, and it's permeating and burning through their chest. I mean, this is the way that they would think. So I'm going to take a picture and I'm going to look at your insides. And I have always showed my children their x-ray. I had that ability. There was one of those things um, that was connected that I could bring up their x-rays. And the kids loved looking at their insides and they understood more. Remember, ADHD is a big, common school age disorder. It's all about distractibility. I'm doing something, somebody starts something and they go, oh, I want to do that now. And whatever they're doing, they lose interest. They are not completing tasks. They're always interrupting. You can't keep them seated. And one of the things with this is school nurse uh, is a big component because usually these children are sent to the office because they are distracting their class too much. What it is said is don't think the parents have done nothing. What I want you to do is talk to the parents, see what's going on, let them explain to you, and then make a plan. So depression. Any age kid can have depression, right? 
We know it's more of your older school age into those adolescents because it's body image type things, right? What would you see? Well, you're going to see them being more sad, not liking themselves. They don't want to do anything. They're not eating. Maybe too much they're eating or maybe not enough. They're sleeping too much, sleeping too little. And if a child ever, ever says anything about they'd rather be dead, which means they could commit suicide, take it as a real threat. Dental health. Kids should be brushing their teeth, even should be taking care of their gums, you know, as they're growing up to keep their, their mouths um, fresh so that you're not going to have infections in there. So brushing before bedtime is really important. But remember, flossing helps the most. Now, when you are up to first grade, sometimes those little flossy strings, they can't do it. They, they that manual dexterity is not there yet, but we should make sure that soft bristles, they have fluorinated toothpaste. Remember, if you have a kid who's just losing teeth that's too quick, there's something going on with dental health that needs to be looked at. And we know that cavities do cause pain. Now, adolescence. Well, who am I? What am I? What am I going to be? Where am I going to college? You know, all of these things are going on. And we know it is a fight for independence and control. It's, you know, privileges and responsibilities. What do I want? And they're going to be exploring everything. A lot of it is body image, you know, fitting into these peer groups. So as I said before, a negative body image can cause depression, can cause suicide. So leading cause of death in adolescence, well, car crash, of course, but suicide and then risky behaviors like playing with guns, right? I'm old enough now to touch daddy's gun. I'm going to go out and shoot in the backyard. Well, that's when things happen. Nutrition, nutrition. Well, you're saying, well, these are adolescents now. Well, in the beginning of adolescence is that pre-adolescent growth spurt. And they're growing really a lot. 25% of their whole height is then. Adolescents take a bottle of water and a power bar and run out the door. And that's what they have for the day. Because, well, they don't have time. Or they think they're too fat. Or they want to be skinnier or whatever it is. And remember, all of those things can lead to things like anorexia nervosa and bulimia. Remember, at age 12 ish somewhere some 12 13 you need to go ahead and get the hpv it is a three shot series you know and it's something that girls and boys are both recommended to get talking to adolescents about sex can be very difficult they're not talking to mom why are they talk why aren't they talking to you um, they just don't trust the, you know, the older person, you know, and I always was an older person, you know, working in the ER. So how did I get these adolescents to talk to me? Well, they're coming in and I hear music in their ear pods. I'm like, so what sort of music do you like? So they start talking to me or I'm like, oh my goodness, where'd you get those sneakers? My kid needs one of those. Where did you find them? I've been looking. So now you've got their attention. You're seeming like you're less threatening. Get the parents out of the room and let them talk. Do not act surprised and let them express their feelings. Remember, they only want to be listened. They just want somebody to listen to them So and be non-judgmental. And if they need any education about sex, it's not what you think. It's what, okay, what do you need to know? Well, where can I get the pill? Well, you can give them that information, oral and written information. Again, that's part of the trust that you build up to get that rapport. And the other thing that's a big thing in children, the adolescents, is sleep. They are so busy on the phone, texting, playing games, doing stuff for school because they need that A to get in that college, going to the baseball games, going here and there, the buddies and them, and they're not sleeping. And they are growing. Remember, the beginning of this, they've grown 25% of their body weight. So they need good nutrition and they need good sleep. They're not really getting it. And you know, you're gonna see them um, sleeping in class and whatnot. 
So anyway, they should get sleep, but they really don't. As I already said about depression, suicide, it's that intense, you know, loneliness for things that can happen, you know, and it could be that body image. Um, we know um, any suggestion, we're going to make sure that we uh, notify who we need to on that. Now, the Tanner stage of development, when I start to grow, what am I going to look like? Well, I say you start with nothing and you end up with everything, right? So you start with a flat chest girl and you start with the breast bud. And then you go on to complete the breast, the hair, pubic hair, menses, and all the curves and everything, right? And boys start with the enlargement of the scrotum and then they go to the complete shape and the facial hair and uh, axilla hair, et cetera, et cetera. So tanners start with nothing, end up with something. Menstruation, as I said, starts about two years after puberty. And it is not uncommon, which means it's common to have girls with irregular menstrual cycles. Remember, they're growing tall. They're growing, gaining weight for those two to three years in those pre-adolescent growth um, time, like 12 to 14. So it's all about being moody um, and being irregular, okay? Now, Fowler's is another one that we talk about. It's all about spirituality. Like I said early, you need to let the person have their own faith. You don't have to agree with it, but you need to give them what they need, their time, their space, whatever, in order to have their own faith. Um, it's very important to many people. And again, it starts what, with first, uh, examining your own spiritual um, feelings. Here we are. I put some two basic dosage calculation videos here. You've had them before. I put them again. I wish you all the best. And I will get these reviews out to your teachers shortly. Now, Funi, I need your name so that I can give you credit. 